Welcome to the DIY Writer Show with the mild-mannered, slightly heroic host, Jeff Bacon. This is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast. Today, we have, uh, actually, we have TJ Atiri back. And the reason that I asked him to come back is that he's done a lot of research on the Celts and the Celtic uh, uh, societies. And I thought it'd be really good to, uh, and everybody knows if you watched his, uh, his previous uh, podcast with me, that he's a teacher. So I invited him back to teach us a little bit about the uh, Celtic religion, which is Druidism, or Druids and Druidism, Druidism, the, sorry. Eh, you know, that happens. But, yes. um, and also a little bit about their society in general, and maybe get a little bit into the, uh, the effect they had on, on Rome's culture. But without any further ado, TJ, I'm going to give the floor to you and you just, uh, I'll ask you a few questions here or there, but uh, let's, let's do this. Hey, well, thanks for having me back. I had a great time last time. So I just want to thank you for that. Oh. Um, brought me back to talk about what I like to talk about probably more than anything else in the world, which is the ancient Celts. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I bet you I'm going to probably missave druidism about 10 times during this presentation uh, as well as a number of other things that i'm probably mispronouncing in old irish or uh, celtic or gaelic so um i think we got a little latitude on that one um yeah I, i've been studying the celts sort of uh, just as a hobby really for it's gotta be 18 years now wow. um but it hasn't stopped me from like trying to put uh, what I would consider a professional level of uh, research into it. Um, it's the kind of thing where you really wish you could talk to other people who did the archaeology and historians, uh, which uh, so many of them are overseas, of course, in Europe, where the archaeological sites and historical sites are. Um, but, um, you know, especially prior to getting into internet research, it was all just delving into books, delving into nonfiction about it. So mm -hmm. um, I love talking about it. I'm glad to talk about it. Um, Cool. Religion seems to be a big thing um, for you. And you're, you're absolutely right about Druids and Druidism. And there's so many misconceptions about um, Druidism. In fact, a lot of people don't even know they're associated with Celtic culture. They assume actually that they're um, in, uh, responsible for things like Stonehenge, uh, which everyone I'm sure knows about, and Newgrange in Ireland, which I had the, uh, the privilege of actually going into when I went to Ireland. Um, were you, were you part of a team there or did you just go to just a visit? It was an archaeological tour. I, I vied to get on several uh, excavations that when I was, uh, you know, yeah, coming out of college, but I was actually still in college in a Celtic archaeology course, um, which kind of prompted this trip. So we didn't actually get to dig. Um, unfortunately, I really wanted to do that, of course. Um, but we did get some sort of special permission to go into certain sites and around certain sites that the general public was not allowed to. Um, so, yeah, I'm absolutely uh, happy to talk about my trip there at some point today. Uh, okay. It was life changing, life changing, uh, both for the Celtic side of things and just for the travel side of things. But, um, yeah, a lot of those sites, those stone monuments that people associate with Celts, um, they're rightly they're right to be associated with ancient Celtic society. But they most of these were not created by Celts. They were created by people proto-Celtic. Um, so a lot of people associate the Druids with Stonehenge, for example. Um, that was built before Druidism, largely before Druidism. And as you're probably aware, as since you're interested in this, they're coming up with new information every day mm -hmm. about how this they think this was put together and um, cultures that were predecessors to the Celts um, that had different funerary practices and whatnot. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many misconceptions, and I, I love talking about clearing those up so you're no you're absolutely right Dru druidism and people know the word druid and like we talked before there's all these descriptions to you know mystery and sacrifice like human sacrifice and um you know stone monuments and things of that nature and not to say that some of that is um unfounded but um there's a lot of misconceptions and we want to talk about celtic religion you have to talk about druidism uh, okay. and you have to talk about what the druids did well, what's the basis of the Druid, uh, Druidic uh, religion? Well, one of the things that makes studying ancient Celtic society difficult is that they had they forbade writing, so there was no internal record. So what we have to look at is archaeology, 
and that's still somewhat of an interpretive science from the person digging the site and classical authors. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely a nature, there's definitely a reverence for nature in their religion. Um, there's definitely this uh, concept of balance um, that I feel like they really practice what they preached when they said that. Um, uh, balance with nature, balance with politics of their society. Um, I'll give a more concrete examples of that in a minute. Um, but I think the most important thing that people need to get about the Druids and about uh, Druidic culture was that they were a, a, a caste in Celtic society, and they did more than just priestly things. They did. They were philosophers. They were judges and adjudicators. Um, they were ovates and bards. Um, that, that's one thing that a lot of the literature I read gets into is that there is essentially three branches or three um, realms of Druidism that a Druid could go into. You'd either be a straight Druid, which would be mainly a judge, a priest, uh, someone that communes with the pantheon of gods or the cult, mm -hmm. uh, the god, the patron god or matron god of a particular clan or tribe. Um, but there were others like bards with, that were straight poets. Um, and they memorized, I mean, like when I say poems, I'm talking like Iliad level poems and, and Odyssey level poems, not like a couple of verses that we might be able to do. Um, and they, they recanted a lot of their, their stories and philosophies through that. And uh, one of the ones I, I, that I didn't even recognize the word when I first started studying was Ovage. And if I'm, I'm even saying that properly, but these were, um, these were bird, they, they studied bird signs and signs in nature as a way to prophesy like the future. And mm -hmm. uh, obviously we don't know that they were accurate, how often they were accurate, but um, I can tell you from being a kayaker, which we talked about last time, that you can read some signs in nature and uh, imagine a society that's outside all the time is gonna have some insight to that. So right. uh, many roles, many roles to the Druids. I think that's the number one key thing to get about them to understand different roles of Druidism. The other thing too that's, that, um, is just that amazes me and continues to amaze me is uh because they didn't have this celtic society didn't have uh written records it's not to say that they were all illiterate or that they didn't have like ceremonial writing systems but because of that memorization was so important to their society and um druids would study sometimes uh for 20 years from like childhood up until you know 20s or 30s um, in Druid school, sometimes out in the glade somewhere in continental Europe or England or Ireland, um, and memorize, they would memorize stories, bits of wisdom, and it would all be stored internally. Um, it makes me wonder, like, how society today, where we have all these reminder systems, Google, Google and Siri and all this, uh, these things you can put on your phone and calendar, how, I wonder if that's part of our brain is actually shrinking of the ability to remember, because we're talking about groups of people that you could drop them anywhere and they would know anything. Everything would be stored in a digital library sort of in their brain. And it's just unbelievable. Right. But you're also talking about a time before the Gregorian calendar, <clears throat> before they actually had a one o'clock in the afternoon, you know, before everybody's working eight to five and doing this and making appointments and, you know, so on and so forth. So, I mean, they, I, I, I don't know that a brain shrinking, but I would all, I would say that there's a lot more distractions from actually trying to remember something. A lot of people don't remember stuff simply because they can look it up on Google now. True. You know, if the internet ever goes down, they're going to be, you know, freaking lost. They won't know how to start yeah. a fire. They won't know how to, you know, anything like that to whereas, you know, I mean, I think that it depends on what you're paying attention to. Because Absolutely. a lot of people can sing a song, can sing a whole album because they've memorized it, because they mm. care about it, you know. But you can ask them what day of the week it is and be like, oh, uh, Tuesday, sure. you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Between the distractions and what we prefer to remember, what we find easier to remember, um, it's absolutely right. I, I at the same time, I, I don't know that just as a teacher, I see that the like things that we would ask students to memorize, like I remember my 50 state capitals, I remember stuff, mm -hmm. even even like geography in Asia, I learned in 10th grade um, and I didn't have the games that they have. So just even even if it's not a comparison, the ability to, to and, the, and the philosophy of, of, of memory and the importance yeah. was was critical to them. And and. Um, it, you're absolutely right. It has detriments because think about think about the Romans, for example. They documented 
freaking everything. Mm -hmm. And we know a lot more about them conclusively because of all these things and you're comparing it with archaeology. And, you know, so like there's absolutely a drawback, but the, re the resourcefulness, I imagine, for the average Druid was probably pretty good, whether it was just memorizing things about the, the, the land, landmarks, nature, geography, or if it was, you know, wisdom and acts of wisdom and philosophy, which they eventually would impart on to other people in the Celtic society. Um, absolutely memory key to the Druids. So what were some of the main gods that they would, uh, that they would worship and how, would, how, how did that work into the, into society? Well, they absolutely right there. They're pantheon of gods. There's a polytheistic religion. Um, and it, a lot of it, a lot of the, you, we were right when we were talking earlier about how they have, this is a society that isn't one coagulated state like Rome was and it was closer to I guess Greek city states clans and mm -hmm. tribes in that aspect but lots of aspects of their culture were shared um, nevertheless uh, one tribe might have one patron god and another might have a matron goddess and they might understand who each other's um, main gods were or the cult that the other um, tribe might have uh, worshipped or celebrated um, but places specifically had uh, particular gods tied to them. Um, the, the one that comes to my mind more than any is the statue that's right next to me here, which is uh, Morrigan, which um, has some sort of connections to some Arthurian legends, maybe potentially some inspiration behind um, some Arthurian legends. Um, and she's a big matron uh, goddess in a lot of the tribes in Ireland and, and the UK and what's now mm -hmm. the UK. Um, she definitely had a presence in um, the continental European Celtic culture too. Um, but she was a goddess of war, a goddess of death. Um, absolutely can find parallels to her in uh, Viking culture and others, uh, some other cultures in the Middle East that are even earlier that predate Celtic society. So there's probably some Indo-European influence there. But um, I found her to be the most, the one that captivated me the most because um, number one, we have a, a war deity that's female and not just a war deity that's female, but the war deity that's female right. um greeks and romans had you know female warrior gods and goddesses of course um but the most commonly mentioned one no matter what name they call her um is morrigan and uh, she's got so many names she's a triune goddess so she's got three aspects um if you've ever heard and you probably hear her hear this in a lot of viking stuff and other uh, polytheistic religions too like the maiden the mother and the crone as three aspects of one goddess right um, she, she goes by so many names, uh, Maka, Bab, Namain, and a, a few others that I, I probably can't even remember or pronounce properly, but, um, definitely one that struck me. She's, she's a huge figure in, um, particularly the Irish mythological cycles, it's like the, uh, the Tainbo, which was a cattle raid of Cooley, um, and, uh, the Ulster cycle and all, all, all other ones that I feel like a lot of the contemporary Irish heroes stem from, mm -hmm. um, so very, very cool. And, uh, you know, people tend to think a well, war goddess, death goddess is, is going to be angry and negative. And, and um, like you said, like we were talking earlier about Loki and all these other gods that sometimes are popularly not portrayed very well. Um, there's aspects to her that I think are very benevolent and have to do with fertility as well. Um, one cool thing about her is um, she uh, inspired a lot of those washer at the Ford legends. So if you're familiar with that whole like idea of uh, if you have a soldier sees an apparition of a beautiful woman in a river washing armor, it's like it's like an omen of death. So I right. really hope as much as I don't mind looking at attractive people, I hope I never <laughs> see someone washing my clothes in a river while I'm kayaking, because then uh, I'm probably not going to live out the day. So, <laughs> uh, wash her at the Ford Banshees. She might she there's some talk that she might have inspired the concept of Banshees, of Banshees. because she definitely has like a haunting kind of presence. But and I'm absolutely happy to get into the specifics about the myths as well at some point. Yeah, let's let's talk about the myths. Yeah, so there are many gods in the Celtic Pantheon. Um one of the it's it's amazing how uh so many pop culture things or, or people that want to put their own spin on things adapt a lot of Celtic society and other societies to kind of fit their narratives. Um, but interesting part about the, um, the Book of Invasions is really the first beginning of Celtic mythology as I understand it. It has to do with the fact that Ireland was inhabited by people that weren't Celts, 
that weren't even the gods of the Celts. They were a race of, uh, of, of giants, essentially, uh, that were inhabiting the British Isles. And mm -hmm. from the sea came the Tuatha Tuat Tuat Didana, which were the Celtic pantheon. I, it would be essentially Celtic, Celtic version of the gods of Olympus, the main, uh, the main pantheon. Uh, among them was Morgan. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, they decided to conquer Ireland from these giants. And that was the first, one of the first major mythological descriptions was a battle between these, Kel what would be the Celtic gods and later the fairy, fairy people um, uh, against these giants. And they sort of took possession of Ireland from them. Interestingly, um, some modern scholars actually believe the Book of Invasions might be like a mythological take on what actually happened in Ireland with different group, ethnic groups of people preceding the Celts and after the Celts coming to Ireland. Uh, so, you know, there's, I don't know if we have enough information to say that definitively, but some, some authors I've read have made some pretty conclusive or pretty uh, convincing arguments that, well, okay, well, this, this group of gods was the Celts and this next group was a Gaelic culture. And this next group was, uh, you know, like the, uh, the Saxonization mm -hmm. of Britain, et cetera. Um, so it's interesting I, how the myths. I, I was just going to bring up um, one thing that I think is kind of interesting is that I don't remember what the day is, but there's a day in London where um, they celebrate Gog and Magog, hmm. which are two giants. Yeah. Um, which are supposed to be. I can't remember the name of the day either. Um, I was just going to look it up. They're wicker giants. Da, 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 da. I, yeah, it, it's not important what the day is. If anybody's interested in it, they can do that. But that also ties into some biblical history uh, mm. from the Christian religions, Gog and Magog. Yeah. Because they're supposedly uh, descendants of... Uh, the Nephilim or, or yeah, yeah. I, were they, were they descendants of Nephilim? Out. Were the descendants of one of the sons of uh, Noah? I, I I'd have mm. to look it up again, but I think it was I, I think, think it was one of Noah's right. one of Noah's kids. It wasn't it wasn't Shem. Um, I, I'd have to look it up, but I, I just think that's interesting that you know. So the Celtic religion talks about Ireland being full of giants, and also uh, the pagan religion where this is based on that uh, that London still celebrates Gog and Magog. Um, are also giants, so there must there had to be giants on the British British yes, Isles. Right. Had to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, of course, like there's like flood myths in lots of religion. There's uh, apocalypse myths or, or um, pre revelations and prophecies. But mm -hmm. absolutely, that I mean, sound linguistically, like there's a connection between the Celts, uh, maybe inspiration for the, that holiday. But speaking of holidays. Um, Beltane, right? Uh, that's a May Day, what we call May Day now, the 1st yep. of May, usually the 1st of May. That was one of the cardinal holidays for the Celts, and that represented when the uh, the gods and goddesses came off of their ships and landed in Ireland to start in taking it over. And uh, it's associated oh. with the god Bell, who uh, was is a fire god or is, is, is uh, represented by fire. And uh, the story behind that is really interesting. Um, and it's something we see a lot of in like movies that they try to emulate. And that's, uh, it might have even been Morgan who said it that said, look, we are not retreating. We're going to take this damn island or we're going to die, you know, as much mm -hmm. as a god, as a deity could die. So in order to like encourage that, you know, in the myth, they burn the ships that they arrived on. So there would be no retreat. <laughs> um, and that's why Beltane festivals uh, thereafter in Celtic society and even in some May Day festivals bonfires are a huge deal so like commemorate the ships no retreat absolute attack um so lot, lots of holidays that's actually there's four principal um festivals that's sort of centered around the equinoxes and solstices mm -hmm. um beltane being one of the major ones uh and then uh what we call halloween but was uh, samhain samhain as people see it spelled um was the other one that's the i would say that would be the most important one um i am biased because i do like halloween and i am uh, so do i i'm a, I'm a fan of more the goddess morrigan and that's her hot particular holiday um <laughs> but uh that's another that's a perfect example of something that's celtic that has absolutely pervaded to today um and uh that was that's the beginning of the celtic new year um it's oh, weird that we think i didn't it. know that that's yeah halloween is Halloween, yep, yep. So huh. uh, October thirty first to November third, and that range is when the yeah, the rationale behind.
behind that was that it was the complete end of the harvest and it was the beginning of winter. So um, and, and in a lot of ways to me, it felt more like a new year. Uh, I don't know if it was just mm -hmm. the, the, the wintering of things is sort of depressing and you have to start anew. Um, but, it, you know, I, I'm in the Northeast. We start to get cold and dark, obviously. Yeah. Then too. So um, it's absolutely the, the Celtic New Year. And that obviously you can see how that that um, translated to All Souls Day and Christianization of those those holidays. Um, those would I would say those are the two big holidays. But then the other two would be in bulk, which is uh, usually February 1st, February 2nd. Um, that's Bridget. If, if we're looking for a goddess, uh, patron goddess for that one, a matron goddess for that one, it would be Bridget, uh, Morrigan's daughter, goddess of love. Um, and that's that's like the halfway point of winter. In bulk is the halfway point of winter. It's supposed to, the way I, I remember reading about it was it had something to do with the um, the lactation of the ewes, the cows or the um, goats and lambs sure. starting to produce milk. So that was like a sign that we're halfway through the hard, cold, dark season. So um, lots that of makes sense. festival holidays with that. And then the other one would be in August 1st, August 1st, August 2nd, um, which is Lunasa, which some people have heard of, um, dedicated to the god Lu, who's also a very cool one to talk about. Four primary Celtic festivals, and they correspond, they don't always hit the dates of the equinox. In fact, they, they I, I think, the premise was it was almost about a month or 40 days after the equinox. And I don't remember the, I have to be honest, I don't remember the reason why it didn't coincide directly with what our Gregorian calendar says is the equinox, because the bottom line is the sun and the moon. See, and, the, and that, and, and that interest, the, the 40 days thing interests me because that crosses many religions. Yeah. 40 days from one point to another. And I, I do not, I, 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 I've never been able to figure out, and I'm sure that, you know, if there is an answer, it's somebody way smarter than me, what that 40 days means, why it's always 40 days. I mean, that, that interests me that the, even the, uh, the Druids had that too. So you got, you know, like Lent is 40 days. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm pretty sure like there's a Greek, uh, it might, might not be exactly 40 days, but I, I'm aware that like Greek Orthodox, I believe it is, celebrates Christmas, I think, three weeks after or, or some yeah. sort of time. And I know that there's definitely other holidays that sort of follow suit. So as, as you're saying that, I think you're really on. Something. Well, there's a there's another one, uh, Pagan, the Pagan religion, which is kind of, uh, they put Easter kind of right over the top of it, which is what the uh, um, something of tears or whatever, which is a 40-day period that leads up to the resurrection of... Mm. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I can't remember, but it leads up to somebody else's resurrection, you know, but it's mm -hmm. a 40 day period. So they put Lent right on top of it and said, yeah, oh, this is, you know, Lent is 40 days prior to the you know resurrection of Christ. And um, there's another, uh, um, there's another one. Uh, I'm not going to say it because I'm not sure if it's right or not. I'd, I'd have to look at, I, I wrote a little bit about this a while ago, like, you know, five, six years ago. And that's what stuck to me is there's so many religions that have 40 days of something celebration or 40 days of morning fat, you know, probably morning. not fasting because people would probably die, but, uh, Oh, they did fasting. I mean, I, well, I, well, well, full fasting anyway. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, no, definitely, <laughs> you know. definitely some sort of like, time frame and an important number in there they, i want to say that the that the lent had a little at least uh, the said reason was that jesus walked through the, de the desert for 40 days but i could be horribly mistaken on that but no, uh, you, there's there's definitely i think that i think numbers are important i think when we, right. when we talk about numerology with this stuff and i think it, it's it can be evidence of um cross-pollination and, and influence uh, and I, I can give like we were you were talking about um catholicism and how how certain like aspects of the roman society and catholicism lent very easily into druidic monism and that that it, it curtailed celtic and druidic culture in a lot of ways but well okay i have a triune god or goddess well that's sort of like a trinity so i can sort you know what i mean things sort of line mm -hmm. up druids it's not a coincidence that monks and druids uh like those hooded robes i i'm pretty convinced that that was a that was a pretty uh, easy translation from pagan celtic ireland to um catholicism and, and catholicism yep. that was spreading over the isles you know um 
I don't think it's about any one connection, but I think when you start to add up all these different things, you, you definitely see some influence. Um, yeah, I, I was just uh, uh, remembering, um, I was thinking about Hinduism. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's certain time periods that are 40 days. And yep. I'm just like, okay, what is the deal with 40 days? Why, why not? Why not 43? Why not yeah. 38? You know, why but not 70? 40, yeah. You know, and, and how are they measured the day or whatever? I mean, you know, you can get into whatever, but uh, it's just, I think it's significant. And, you know, the, uh, the thing that I find interesting, like you were saying, you know, the hooded robes and, you know, um, the way that. A uh, it's, uh, there's a haircut called the tonsure that monks uh, right. wore. It, it, I, 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 I've seen it on one person and he was not a monk. He was a barber. So I guess he just liked the, the haircut. It's oh. weird. If I have it correctly, it's like bald around uh, like the sides and the top, but then like a little jut of hair in the back. And I remember uh, reading in a few sources that that was like a popular haircut amongst the Druids, or at least the Romans and the, uh, the Greeks recorded that as such. And, I, and, then, and then I read subsequently that... Um, lots of monks tend to adopt that hairstyle so like mm-hmm. again you put a bunch of these things together uh some of it seems a little too coincidental to be coincidental absolutely absolutely um the uh so kind of getting back to the gods that they uh that they did um you know one of the things that uh, that you see in a lot of books and a lot of people are writing is that in the juridic um um religion tattoos are huge hmm i definitely read that that was that was done that that tattoos were done in celtic society um i haven't read extensively enough about them to to tell you that they were big or common i i I would venture to say that they weren't as big to the druids and celts as they were to uh the vikings and uh, many other cultures okay um what i can tell you is woad was a big deal and this, if anybody's ever seen Braveheart, and that's not Celtic culture that we're talking about, that's way later. But this idea of painting blue war paint on you definitely is a Celtic idea. Okay. Um, it, well, it is a plant. I, I actually, at one point, I, I used to work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And uh, I'm very privileged to work there. It was a great job. But one of the outbuildings that they own is a place called the Cloisters in New York. It's a separate castle, essentially, that they put in Fort Tryon Park right at the tip of Manhattan Island. Um, and there they have medieval cloisters. And uh, when I was going there, they had woad plant. And I was so tempted to take a leaf of this thing just so I could make my own blue war paint. Um, but obviously didn't want, to, didn't want to steal from their botanical collection. But yeah, face painting, this idea of, of the terror behind face painting, uh, spiking up the hair when going to battle with um, also with woad, but also, also with wax uh, was a big thing. Going into battle naked was a big thing for Celts, um, <laughs> which, uh, yeah, the Romans love talking about that. And uh, I mean, the Romans I, with all their armor love talking about that. But, I, I read something about that. I I was just uh, looking up, uh, go, just kind of going back to the tattoos and, and I'm mm-hmm. not sure exactly where I read it, but uh, there, you know, some sort of a correlation between some of the Celtic tattoos and some of the uh, tattoos that you'd see on, um, on uh, Hawaiians and you know mm-hmm. how you know the, there's just there's some sort of assimilation between the two or something it was something like that I think nowadays there's a lot of that too like like the kind of the quote-unquote tribal patterns they're definitely uh Polynesian Melanesian Oceanic in a lot of ways but I can go to tribes in the Arizon that I've studied anthropologically uh, you know through literature seeing pictures that I could say well I, if I saw this on someone's arm I'd say it was Polynesian or, or even um where was it? Uh, uh, somewhere in the Middle East. I can't remember which country in the Middle East, but I, someone showed me their tattoo, and I said that that's got to be like tribal, tribal Polynesian, you know, Southeast Asian maybe. And they were like, no, that's like from you know Oman or something. So yeah, um, yeah I, I wonder if that's a result of people just sort of being eclectic with their tattoos. But I don't know. That's like we're saying a lot of this stuff. It, it, the world, I think one of the things that people don't realize about the ancient world is that even without the internet, electricity and communication at the speed, a lot of ways, in a, in a lot of ways, parts of the ancient world were a lot more connected than people think, a lot more. Well, at one point in time, the Celts controlled all of Europe. 
Yeah. I mean, all yeah, of and that's Europe. something people don't talk about. You're right. Yeah. Most of continental Europe and the British Isles. Yeah. Um, in fact, Galatia, the, the part of Turkey known as Galatia, is named Galatia because Gaulish Celts, Gallic Celts, moved out and settled down there. And a few few of uh, the, the historical references I have come from that part of the, of the, the world. Um, even and, even Spain, Celt Iberians. Yep. And if you ever read the Bible, there's there's that book called Galatians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I think it's St. Paul basically uh, criticizing everything about them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, that seems to be like the letter, the, what the letters were doing. But um, yeah, that's yeah, absolutely yeah. where I first heard the term um, Galatians. And uh, once I read that, once I initially read that, I was like, and, and I am not a, like a linguistics person per se. I, I find it interesting, but I'm not a linguist and I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not someone who studies language. But I'm sure you get this when any time you're doing any type of intense research, you start to know, you start to see patterns in the way the different, the names are like, um, like Welsh Celtic names or, or, or Welsh names for Celtic deities have lots of Ys and Ds in them. So I, I can see it. It might look familiar. And I might not know it, but I, I'm pretty confident that, that they're talking about that god or goddess because of yep. uh, I'm just reading so much. I'm seeing those commonalities, um, you know, and that, that, that's that I find to be um, it's like sort of like an incidental benefit. You're sort of learning a little bit about language and uh, you're seeing how you can trace things through language, trace connections, the same way you do it through art, archaeology and uh, motifs in the art, Celtic art or Native American art or whatever. You can track these things through language and it's, it's, it's brilliant. It's interesting. I think it's, it's, it's interesting how you track it like that. I think it's also interesting how, um, so many of the, uh, you know, they may have a completely different name for something, but it's exactly the same. Like you said, the yeah. goddess Morgan. Mm -hmm. Okay. She shows up in many different cultures throughout time. Yeah. You may not, you, you may not, you know, not called the same. Like you said, she's got a bunch of different names, but all of a sudden you see that same kind of figure, like you said, in Greek, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, one of the Roman religions, I think has something kind of similar to it or else, or else you also see religions take somebody who has, like you said, three or four different traits and split them off into two different gods. Yes. Yes, absolutely. You know, I mean, or into, and, or into Catholic saints, like oh, I yeah. mentioned Bridget, right? <laughs> yep. St. Bridget of Kildare is really just a Christianization, a Catholicization of uh, the goddess Bridget. So yeah, you're absolutely right. The, whether they're archetypes, they're, they're historical or uh, mythological archetypes. Uh, you know, the other thing too is like, it's so, it's so hard to not look back far enough back in history. Like you have to look at the fact, like you mentioned Hinduism. I, it's, I'm not as nearly as well versed in that, but I've been to a Hindu ceremony. I've studied it. I teach it to some degree to students. Um, Celtic, what designates whether something is Celtic is the language group. And it's Indo-European language, and Indo-European is a is a swath of early cultures that sort of migrated around from mm -hmm. India and Pakistan area all the way out to where we're talking about in, in Europe, the continental and uh, insular Europe. So, um, yeah, sometimes it gets you thinking: Are these just archetypes, and then people put their own spin on it, or are they adapting it and modifying it? Are they splitting it up, like you said, into? multiple things or they co-opting it you know they talk people talk about cultural appropriation well religions like to do that they'll never admit to doing it but right. especially polytheistic religions i well, i really like what this god does well maybe if i could change it into like the morals of christianity or, or any other religion uh, maybe change the dogma behind it but keep the figurehead there mm -hmm. in a way that that works you know you're you're taking legitimacy from a past culture and, and trying to kind of stealing it, the thunder for yourself um you know and, and all cultures do it to some degree even the celts did it to the, their predecessors sure sure um you know let's let's talk a little bit about um um you know we talked about how they they had basically they had all of europe and they had you know the british isles um i'm not sure if they went so far as into the middle east i'm i'm sure they did but I didn't, I, I've never found any documentation to say that they actually did or else they actually called them Celts at mm. the time. I, I mean, I, I just don't know. Um, uh, my understanding is is uh, Turkey is as far as they've gone as like a settling society. But, you know, 
Hannibal of Carthage had Celts in his army, and right. I think we'd be we'd be foolish to think that they didn't make their way. There's certain individual Celts and Druids might have made their way out in the world. I think that they did. I think that they did. Yeah, and had and and probably had a good amount of influence on a lot of societies that we look back on to, or even you know as we see today. You know, mm-hmm. again, um, I'm you know again I I. I look at some of the Asian stuff and I think that's, that's fairly unique compared to, you know, the rest of the world. But uh, um, I do think that if you look into, uh, you know, the, uh, the African, the Middle East, European and America, or, uh, you know, North and South America, I think you can find a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say, you know, strange similarities between the religions that existed here and what we see as religion today. Yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and, you know, when you look at these ancient religions, like, you know, Druidism and, and paganism and, and those types of things, it almost looks like they either had some influence on it or that, you know, maybe those are older religions that had influence on them. I mean, we don't know. We can't go mm. back that far with archaeology. Yeah. It gets me thinking about that this a lot, like, uh, just again, from that anthropological perspective. You might ask yourself, why did the how did the bow and arrow develop in Asia and at the same time in South America without any cultural contact? Now, a lot of people will have crazy conspiracy theories about, you know, aliens introducing these ideas to them and and, and or people making these long distances that there's no evidence that they did, despite the fact that there are some cultures uh, that have taken very long voyages very early on in history. You know, some of it is just there's only so many ways to solve a problem, even even mythologically, even religiously, you know, warrior archetype, mother, father archetype, you know. But when you get down into it, you're seeing some specific things. Some of the things you're mentioning, it makes you, it does make you wonder about influence and, and the, the speed of influence, even at the times that we're talking about. <laughs> you want to hear a goofy conspiracy theory? Sure. Why this not? one, eh, this is this is what I think. So it's just what I think. Um, I don't. I, I assume some other people kind of think this way. Maybe not. Um, this is not biblical. Okay, but there's enough references to a great flood that, in my mind, there is a great flood. Of some, I don't think of some that that's that. I don't think that okay. that's that out there at all. Because okay. I mean, that's so it's possible for that. My my whole thinking is is that is that we have no idea what was there before that because it's all buried in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of yards of mud and guck and was wiped out. <clears throat> my guess is that there was a great there was a great society that had technologies that we have no idea what the hell I mean how they were even doing things. Maybe they had different technologies. Maybe they worked with magnetics. Maybe they worked with all sorts of different things that we don't understand. And we, and we went down a different path with, you know, electricity and, and uh, you know, carbon fuels and stuff like that. Maybe they had other things that they, that they knew. When the Great Flood happened, however you want to say it happened, it wiped a majority of that out, but there were some su- survivors. Those survivors, maybe they were all one big society at that point in time. Maybe they got separated, you know, maybe they're on opposite ends of, you know, maybe they all found different hilltops to sit on and watch the waters go, you know, whatever it was. Again, you know, and, and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, which is really weird. Um, another 40. <clears throat> what's that? Another 40. No, 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 yeah, another 40. 40. Returns. So those people, you know, once the water receded, went forth and populated the earth again, right? You can say it, it was Noah and his kids. You can say whatever you want, you know, depending on what religion it is. But they had certain technologies and certain knowledge that they brought to those societies that, you know, came from the past. So they could have had bows. They could have had this. They could have had that. They might not have had the resources that they had before to have the same technologies. So they developed new technologies based on on what they had before them, you know. I mean, it it could be just a transference of, of some knowledge. And it may not, it may be that, you know, the smartest people that were in that society that developed all the technology all died. And it's just the, uh, you know, people that kind of knew what was Layman, going on, yeah. you know, and so they had to figure out new things, you know, I mean, it, it, there's all sorts of things, but I think, I think a lot of, I think a pivoting point for human history had to be whatever, whatever caused that flood, that there was a flood 
and it caused a total uh the total destruction of whatever technology technology was available then and you know that that's how they got those things it's um i've heard similar th um theories like this um usually it's regard to like atlantis or or to like retro explain this um I, i'm not gonna say I subscribe to it i definitely think that um it's more than possible that there was some sort of cataclysmic uh, flooding of this earth. I, I think that the geology shows that. My personal experience with archaeology and the concept of what, what we call subsoil and soil that humans have never never interacted with, I would think that if something like that did happen, that we would have some some evidence. Because I mean, granted, it could be buried way way be earlier or uh, further below than what we dig, and we're also talking about what time frame here? If we're talking about like hundreds of thousands of years ago, then maybe maybe nobody's just gotten that far down. People have dug pretty far in this earth, but not excavation wise, not archaeologically necessarily looking for that. So I'm not I'm not uh, certainly not ruling it out of the realm of possibility. Um, and that's purely uh, look, my imagination. I mean, that's yeah, that's just it's like yeah, it makes sense. You know, if I have to. Explain well, you know things. what your your imagination is it has more base to it than a lot of stuff floating around today. So I will. I'll, I I think you. I think it's you're fair. You're fair to say that. You're fair to believe that. And I think that it's definitely worth examining and exploring. And, and um, you know, whether the the predecessors to like that you're mentioning um, existed or didn't, or they influenced what we know as society that evolved after it. Um, why not keep looking into it? Why not keep digging for evidence? Why not um, look at these historical comparisons and what, what these societies had in common, whether they are just archetypes and stories or there is some sort of common thing. I mean, we know that there were like glaciation period, periods that affected animals and mm -hmm. proto-humans on this planet, like, and that, that covered the whole planet, you know? I think I think it's a lot more believable saying something like that than trying to say like, oh, well, if the Egyptians made their pyramids with the constellations and the Mayans did the same thing, the aliens must not know. People looked at the fucking sky. Like, right. like they looked at they looked at that, they looked at the, the same stars and they had lots of free times on their hand compared to us. So like definitely there's but there's more base. The one thing that I that I I, I heard this from somebody. And, and I truly believe it because I, I immediately went out that night and I looked at the sky and the sky was different back then than it is now. Okay. So, so like when I was growing up in South Dakota, I could walk out and, and outside and there wasn't a yard light on nothing. And it was completely dark. And the only thing that lit where I, well lit the earth at that point were the stars and the moon mm -hmm. it looks completely different than if you walk out in the city with all the light pollution and everything else and you look oh, God, at it yeah. and you can kind of see it you know and you can't look at the horizon and see everything mm -hmm. you know so if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're looking at this great big huge sky and you start identifying things and you do it night after night you're gonna see stars moving you're gonna see you know how the earth kind of you know is is moving and how this pattern over here this constellation moves over here and this is here the different positions of the uh of the moon and and uh Absolutely. you know all that kind of stuff and it wouldn't take very long i mean you know when we're talking about earth's you know human history i mean it wouldn't take very long to to create maps and then especially, uh, you know, over the course of a year and all of a sudden, hey, look, it's just, this is in the same spot it was last year. You know, yeah. that's weird. You know, I mean, in, in my understanding, that's how like the, uh, the, the, or the scientific age astronomers like figured out what was a star and what was a planet is that they, they were doing what you're, you're talking about. I and mean, this is way past, you know, much more contemporary than ancient, right. ancient society. But I mean, it's, it's the same philosophy. And just because uh, Galileo and Tycho Brahe and, and uh, Copernicus and all of them noticed some of these things didn't mean that they were the first. They were just the first recognized to do it uh, and the first to write well, it down. Well, I mean, I have to, I, the way I tie it back is, you know, the Druids had to do the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm sure they did. They're a very studied and learned people of, of, of nature. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they now, studied it they knew those stars just like anybody else did and um 
here's a, a very tangible example of what you're talking about. Um, I went to New Grange, which is this uh, tumulus. It's like a um, uh, monument. It's a funerary monument that was built before Celtic peoples in uh, in Ireland. It's right next to the River Boyne, which is a major river, and uh, had several historical events associated with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I went inside this, and it's this was built before the Celts, but the Celts utilized it uh, before they started to change from fun uh, cremation funerals to you know inhumation, where we, where we bury people with grave goods. Um, and this temple is older than the pyramids. This this uh, tomb, rather, um, passage tomb is the word I was looking for. It's like a mound. You've probably seen this, and uh, things like Lord of the Rings in the movies, mm -hmm. they sort of adapt this. They meld it with Viking, etc. You know. Um, passage tomb. It's like a it's like a, a stonework tomb with a grass growing uh, built into the top of it, and you would go into tomb. But the thing about New Grange, it's so interesting. It's older than Stonehenge, but it is solarly aligned. On the shortest day of the year, on uh, December twenty first, the sun rises so that this thing was oriented so the sun rises and shoots a beam of light through the chamber right into the cruciform uh, center of it, which you know, that's not a coincidence no. that, 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 they, that they aligned it that way, but they did it without modern scientific experimentation and, and, and uh, equipment. They did it. They did it even without, there's no evidence that it was even the wheel used to move these giant rocks. The base rocks of Newgrange were moved from different corners of Ireland far away. And I think some of them were pulled over from Wales, which means they got it on on a, on a craft to get it over here. These, these are huge stones that you need cranes to lift today. Um, there's still a lot of mystery, even, even without some of the wild stuff that people come up with, there's still a lot of mystery into how people did these things. You know, um, obviously some of it in other places archeologically, like, like for example, with, with the Egyptians, right? Um, it's commonly believed that slaves build the pyramids. That's since been proven pretty wrong because they're finding camps of work gangs, people that were craftsmen that actually hung out the base and quarried the stone. And, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, we're finding out it's more involved than it is. But I don't know, with, between the, the lack of internal writing in Celtic society and some of these things, um, even though that was, like I said, the New Grange was pre-Celtic, but the fact that they revered it and the fact that they were able to do these things back then, I think speaks to your point. I was reading something, and this is totally kind of off subject, but I'll, I'll tie it back here. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of publications out there that deal with quantum mechanics and mm -hmm. quantum theory and quantum threads and string theory and, you know, all, I mean, all sorts of things. And there's a convincing article, not a convincing article, but it, it, it's kind of crazy. But um, the guy actually starts off saying, you know what, I don't believe gravity really exists. It's like, okay, I'm hooked. <laughs> tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me how this works. And so he goes on to say that, uh, you know, gravity is our observation, but how he thinks it really works on a quantum level is that it's opposing energy forces. Hmm. And, you know, he, he goes through and he, he kind of talks about it. It's like, okay, you know, not knowing enough about quantum mechanics and how it actually works. I mean, it could be whatever yeah. and then he comes back and he says okay so when you start looking at all these huge stones being moved all over the place maybe they understood what we call gravity as being uh, uh opposing energy forces and maybe they're able to manipulate that with something whether it be crystals yeah. whether it be magnetics would it be da, 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 da. like leverage techniques that we don't know about yeah <laughs> yeah and yeah. you know and it's just like okay i want more you know, and yeah, I mean, it's like it's the closest to magic as we're gonna see. Is uh, and I mean, look, we let's let's take quantum the quantum world for a minute. Like, I don't know a lot about it, but our physics don't make sense when you go down to that level. An electron yeah. could be in like two places at once, like that. That's like that could break your brain, right? That's that's like philosophy. This is why astronomy and quantum stuff always comes down to philosophy because, right. you know. And probabilities, you know, magical probabilities or mystical seeming probabilities. So um, I'm not going to rule it out. I mean, I don't, I would want to see some some more tangible evidence, but I think it's worth considering. Actually, you got me thinking about, um, you I, you remember a show called In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy, the old old show where we do like bizarre mysteries and stuff oh, yeah, like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so there was an old one about this guy, Edward Lee Skankin, I think his name was. And he built this place, I think it's called Coral Castle in Florida. Um, you're going to want to look this up, I'm sure, after after the podcast. Coral Castle. Really, and if you could find the in search of, you're in for a treat. Because even the way Leonard Nimoy talked about it was interesting. But the um, idea was he created this. And you could, I think the people who own it now charge like a cheap admission to go into it. But he created this like manor maze castle house in Florida with these huge, I think it was basalt things from underwater, rocks from underwater. And there were all these stories, like how the hell did this guy get this stuff here? Cause he did it by himself. People, there was a story where the where a truck driver drove a few of these stones as much as he could carry, which was like only two on the back of his flatbed. And the, the gentleman, uh, Edward was like, um, just go over around the corner for a few minutes. He's like, well, don't you need help? Or aren't we gonna figure out how to get this thing off of there? And he's like, just go around the block for a few minutes, take a walk. And when he came back, like the stones were off, they were uh, oriented and like there was no evidence that anybody or any equipment was there to help. Him. And mm -hmm. they, I, I remember on the show, they actually show, I don't know if this was just fanfare and sensationalism, but they showed two cranes at simultaneously trying to remove one of these stones from the water, these basalt um, like giant stones from the water and the cranes were starting to tip over because they were so heavy so um i mean i i i'm sure by now they've debunked it or something but it definitely it, it, it i'm not going to say stuff like that didn't lead into my thinking when i'm thinking about how these stones from all corners of the uk essentially made their way in ancient times to a place and then getting set up so that you know i was able to go in new grains that was like a as close to uh spirituality as i felt like i could ever get because people aren't allowed in there, but we mm -hmm. were an archaeology tour. They even um, simulated with a flashlight the um, the light shining through as if it would on the 21st. So it was really, it was a very, very cool experience. If you ever get a chance, have you been to Ireland? Or uh, no, I have not. Uh, if you ever get a chance, especially when this pandemic uh, insanity is over and we can travel without having to worry about things, uh, it's such a cool place to visit on so many levels, but if you if you love the stuff we're talking about, you can set yourself up with an archaeology tour that will blow your mind. That'll make you feel like uh, you're reliving history. It's that, really really awesome. That'd be really cool. yeah. <clears throat> that is definitely on my bucket list, but not right now. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> not Unfortunately. Today. Unfortunately. Yeah. So you know when we talk about the Celtic Society and we talked about. Uh, you know, all the mysticism that's, uh, um, you know, kind of, kind of tied to it, you know, throughout history and how, I mean, a lot of that is, you know, they were able to do certain things that, you know, maybe the Romans saw, you know, I mean, the craziness of coming out and, and fighting naked, you know, mm -hmm. and, and some other crazy feats that they do just because they're very, you know, um, they're very skilled fighters, they were very uh and very brave you know they would do things that the romans were like oh <laughs> what were you thinking you know yeah and, and they'd almost think it was god driven or something like that because yeah. they got so far you know absolutely i mean the romans didn't defeat them in a day they weren't they weren't uh you know i mean they actually uh were defeated by them a couple of different times if i'm if i'm yeah correctly you're right no oh. and, and not only that but like um Great TV show if you're ever interested. If you haven't seen it, HBO's Rome series is very, very historically accurate and exceptionally culturally accurate. One of the things that they hit on there was that, and I think accurately so, was that for the longest time, especially during the Roman Republic as it transitions to the empire, the Gaulish Celts and the Gallic Celts were the enemy and the threat to the burgeoning yep. Roman society. Um, Another example of this sort of like how spirituality drives them, this is the kind of stuff that I think really lures me into studying them, is that they would do things for things, they would do things, make these giant trips and even conduct these giant battles for very impractical reasons, like uh, while other groups might conquer because they need the territory or resources or they want the prestige, which don't get me wrong, a lot of Celtic warriors love their prestige, um, or, or just for the money of it. The Celts would do it for different reasons or different groups of Celts. So what comes to mind initially is um, Brennus the First, this Celtic leader named Brennus the First, mm -hmm. who uh, he was the first to lead uh, excursion to sack Rome 
which the Celts did. And they may have been, before the end of the Roman Empire, they may have been, other than other Romans, the only others to come on in to Rome and, and sack the city. Right. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking back to an author I know named Markel, uh, Jean Markel, uh, who is a controversial author in a lot of ways, but comparing what uh, he wrote, um, uh, juxtaposing that and corroborating with other sources, um, what I gathered was this, is that Brennus led this huge expedition to Rome because he heard rumors from other Celts that traded in Rome or were captured by Rome and released that there was something special about the city and there may be a portal to another world there. So like this, this expedition of um, tens of thousands of warriors marched through the Italian peninsula to Rome, defeating early Roman armies and um, really like demoralizing the Romans to the point where they had to like kind of garrison themselves in, in the, the city. And when the Celts got to, the, to Rome, they, they noticed like all these stone buildings and they noticed these white robed senators. They didn't know what they were. They thought they were maybe apparitions from another world. They were looking for a portal to, the, to another dimension, to another, another realm. Um, it's often called the Seed, S-I-D-H-E, I believe. Um, and it's it, this is sort of links into like why they why we think there's ghosts and Halloween because it's a the overlap between the, the mystical world and our, our tangible mm -hmm. world. But to, to 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 do that to risk people's lives to to risk your own life to to find that and there's there's other examples. Um, another Bren, Brennus the second. I don't I don't know that he was related to the first Brennus, but he happened to be named in, in the second Brennus. He led an expedition to Delphi, Greece, which is where the Oracle of Greece was. And um, there's many stories. And because the Greeks were writing about it, there's, we don't know, just like with Caesar, we don't know um, if they're exaggerating their enemy to make it look better when they beat them or whatnot. But there's, there's right. definitely some of the same element of like, ooh, we understand another culture's mystical, spiritual side. And we're willing to like trek hundreds or thousands of miles and risk lives just to go there um it just it fascinates me and i think it also links to why they would fight oftentimes with no armor or naked it, it wasn't just bravery it was just utter confidence that you would continue in another form even after you die even mm -hmm. whether you were crossing a portal into that world you know going through a passage tomb whether you were dying on the battlefield where you're dying in your bed at some point you would be able to cross over it just i i I've studied a lot of societies, not in this level of detail, but it just, all these years, it continues to fascinate me that I, I, I just don't see that that many examples. I, I, you hear Egyptian pharaohs, they want to conquer a new land. Alexander the Great wants to take over the world, but- um, Right, but they did it know, for materialistic reasons. Yeah, for pride, for, for, for control, for power, not, not like, shit, I want to check this out. Let's go right. like- do something big about it so it you know there's a romanticism to their philosophy and to studying it to me and uh i find that appealing and i think it goes hand in hand with the, also with the um you know we do, there's still so much mystery because there's no internal record because you have to be scrutinous of classical authors uh you know greek and roman craft classical authors of it you have to be uh, skeptical and scrutinous of the christian monks that have christianized their stories and bastardized those stories later on mm -hmm. um and you have to also you know archaeology is is it's not an exact science obviously when you find stuff you find stuff and you find a system you find a system you find a series of artifacts but an archaeologist is still human they're going to make suppositions. They're going to, even though they might be using the historical record to, to uh, corroborate or uh, challenge it, they can still infer things. So there's still just so many question marks with the society. And, and it's just amazing. As, as much as I feel like I know them, I feel like there's always so much more to know. And that's what I love about it. You know, the one thing that, that keeps me going is, is technology. And when I read about things that from, you know, whether it's the Celts and whether they want to talk about it being magic versus, you know, uh, something that they developed or whatever, or you're reading about the Egyptians, or even when you're read, reading about the Persians, mm -hmm. you know, there are, there are documents and documentations out there of things that people had seen, you know, much, much like, you know, you were mentioning Atlantis before. Mm -hmm. And how wonderful, you know, everybody always talks about how wonderful Atlantis was and la da 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 and how all of a sudden it just disappeared. 
you know, and, and I think the most viable uh, uh, theory was that it was destroyed by a volcano. Yeah, it's the one I hear most frequently. Or, or meteor I, I think or that's probably right. You know, yeah. and I, I think that, you know, the technologies that they saw in Atlantis may have been either relics of a, of a ancient, of an ancient society, or uh, they, they took things and, and added it in to make a good story, much like uh, fiction yeah. writers do now. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it could be, it could be either or, I don't know, but. Uh, well, you know what, there's no harm in, in continuing their, re, you know, research about it because all we're going to do is either come closer to the reality um, and have a good time while we're doing it. So as long as right. we don't buy into it out of nowhere, I think it's. That's well, and that's, that's the nice thing about this kind of stuff and doing research on it is that it, it's not, it's science, but it's not, it's not like you can go and, and actually, you can look at what you find. You can look at what somebody else has found and then, you know, kind of theorize what it was used for. You may not know, but when I look at ancient cultures and, and know that, uh, you know, batteries were around, you know, in uh at um uh, in iran i think it was iran they had batteries before christ was born in in yeah, dc times i've heard things Those, like this i didn't hear specifically about iran but i've definitely heard you yeah. know, like some, some idea of storing energy some idea of like even the, the principles of a battery today yeah I've heard yeah things there's uh there's an article that i read where um they actually had a uh they had a 500 gallon uh, it was it was some sort of an alloy. I can't remember what it was. Pot of water that they would heat with a candle, and it was broiling hot. Mm -hmm. And scientists wanted to figure out what in the uh, I think it was in the fifties or sixties. Scientists wanted to wanted to figure out how this worked, and so they took it apart, and they could never make it work again. And they destroyed the hot water source for this village Damn. in Iran. And it's like you got to be kidding me. And it had yeah. been around for centuries and nobody knew how it actually worked you know stuff yeah. like that it's like really you can't even conceive i mean that doesn't make any sense that you could light a candle underneath of it and boil hot water yeah or boil, boil water and think about how that's one you know about that's one we just recently know about think about all the stuff that just like you said either got obliterated because of societal collapse or warfare natural disaster like mm -hmm. or just shit but it wasn't written down you know right. like that they couldn't write down um you know it, it's it's weird because it's like um i you know i do a lot of of stuff with my students and just in general with about pseudoscience and how, how to be careful with this ancient alien stuff and you know specious reasoning so a lot of times people what they want to believe trumps what what they what what they logically know can happen so, so I'll give an example. Um, we will we'll say we were talking about Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti, et cetera. Mm -hmm. If there was a breeding population of any of these things, we would have found a dead one by now, you know, or a dead Nessie by now. I, maybe I might have a little bit of a um, um, well, exception for like the ocean because the ocean is really deep, you know, and we can't get to every part of it. But, you know, I, it... it I, I'm, I'm just that, telling I you think. right now, I never mess with anybody on Sasquatch because there are true <laughs> believers out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, no doubt. There no are Shiite I, I Yeti, Yeti believers out there that will um, beat you to a pulp if you say one negative thing about, you know, so we might want to, you know, this goes yeah, way you're beyond, right, you're right. you know, pol uh, you know, political polar uh, opposites. Yeah, those, yeah. those Sasquatch people are committed. Yeah, no, no I, I, trust me, I am, uh, I am friends with a few of them. So <laughs> nevertheless, um, the, po the larger point I'm trying to make is yeah. I think when we get to what really like the real mysteries, the ones that are unexplained, like, the, like what you were explaining about Iran, the, the battery, potential battery, uh, early battery system or battery, um, it, it just makes that what we don't know, the real stuff that we don't know, all the more interesting and 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 like a real crusade to find out. Um, mm -hmm. I say this all the time about the zoo and animals because, you know, people get critical of zoos and understandably so to some degree, but they also anthropomorphize animals so much. A chimpanzee, when people think a chimpanzee is smiling, it's often showing aggression, but we try to put our traits onto the animal. So what I, what I tend to say to people is like, look, we have a lot in common with lots of different types of animals. We really do. Mm -hmm. But it's not all the things that you expect. And when you get away from all the crap that you're projecting onto a situation, history, mythology, animals, whatever, um, 
when you look at what you really do have in common, what the real mysteries are, it just enriches them all the more. And I, I think that's exactly, I feel like what we're talking about is it, it, it's, that's the type of quest that drives us into the science and into the mystery and the intrigue of it all. So we're, we're running up uh, a little bit over an hour. Wow. And, uh, you know, which is, it seems to be the case when I talk to you, we just kind of run on, uh, we, uh, it's fun, we, man. we talk and talk and talk, but I want to end this with one question. What is sure. the most fascinating thing about the Celtic culture in your mind? Well, it's something we haven't talked much about yet. So I'm glad I got an opportunity to. One of the things that drew me to it, other than the stuff we've talked about, was the place of women in Celtic society. Um, there's a big debate among Celtic scholars as to whether the Celts were uh, close to gender egalitarian or not. Um, most scholars say that because kinship, mostly uh, inheritance of land and property and nobility, went through men, that it was still a you know, pretty patriarchal society. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to doubt that that's at least somewhat true. But you have examples of Celtic women in stories, historical accounts, not just in the mythology, but then here you are taking something that's really happening and seeing how it's echoed in the religious and, and mythological aspects. And I think it speaks to some strong things in their society. So like, I have a couple of examples here. I had to literally write them down because there's so many of them. Um, there's examples of Celtic women. There's, there's one woman, Kiamara of, um, of Galatia, where we were talking about. She was... Um, she was raped by a Roman centurion that entered the town and took over it. And she had um, she had a husband and completely disregarded that all of a sudden, of course, because he was just taking what he wanted. And basically, they he ransomed her to the other Celts that lived in Galatia. And this is an interesting story. Um, they sort of did like a prisoner swap over a bridge, and they you know you're, give me the money and I'll give you your wife back. Um, the, and the husband wasn't even there. That's the funny part. He was still at home. He didn't even, I was like, dude, like, come on, your wife's getting, you're getting your wife back to hang out there. Um, so when, when Kiamara goes over um, the river, she signals uh, archers and uh, warriors that were unseen to go over and just kill the Roman centurion and have him decapitated. Not only did she, de she have him decapitated, she took his head, went into her house with her husband, and the husband's like, Jeez, like you, you chopped off this guy's head like honey. It's, it's important to deal honorably. And she throws the, I think she throws the head at his feet and said, that's true, but it's more important for only one man to have slept with me to stay alive. So mm. like you have these stories where of, <laughs> it's not just about fidelity and loyalty, but of empowered women uh, doing things like that. And, and not in the same way that the Roman contemporaries and Greek contemporaries did. You know, there were some very strong Roman women, but they were, they were still in the public sphere relegated to being under control of men. They were shadow right. rulers. In Celtic society, not only do you have female war deities, something that's traditionally um, ascribed to men, but you have female warriors that are on the mm -hmm. battlefield with them. You have mm -hmm. Boudicca, queen of the Iceni in Britain that fought off the Romans and she didn't, she wasn't successful, but I mean, she was, she's one of the most empowered, I think, female leaders ever. And, um, I, that's another one of the debates I feel like I like to keep having is, you know, I, I think that things were a lot more, I'm not going to say it was a completely gender uh, equal society, gender egalitarian society, but I think that that needs to be looked into more. And I think that you, you it's pretty evident when you look into Celtic women that you get a sense of difference from the rest of their classical counterparts. See, the thing that bothers me and when you're reading historical texts is I, I really want to know who the author is because there's a lot of times that I think that women's roles in history are Christianized. Yeah. Meaning or that, minimized. Yeah. Yeah. Minimized or, you know, it, this doesn't fit the narrative of what I think life is on, on this planet. So mm -hmm. I'm going to cut this part out and, and only show the parts where this particular yeah. woman was, you know, maybe uh, stereotypically feminine, or yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, and you know, you you know, a woman can be both. Yeah, you know, very, exactly. very, very, you know, um, aggressive, and also very feminine. I mean, they they have that power; they can do all sorts of things. They're they're magical beings, you know. Yeah, well, you know, but what uh, <clears throat> what I think is funny is that. Um, 
like in the Christian text, I, I interviewed a woman who uh, there used to be female priests until the Catholic church decided they didn't want any women around, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, which was very interesting. And she's done an awful lot of research on it. Um, you know, the Romans, the way they treated women was kind of interesting. And, and they kind of, you know, the women kind of went from, yeah, down, you know, the Egyptians, mm -hmm. they treated women, you know, there, there's lots of women leaders and uh, uh, pharaohs. Yeah, no doubt that that were uh women um the celts you know like you said um i think the greeks had a little bit of uh they they had plenty of strong women in their history but i think towards the end i think they they rewrote some of their religions so that the uh, the main gods were the males not the females yeah. you know but if you go back further the females had an awful lot of you know control over uh, people's destinies a lot more than they did in, in the uh, later texts um yeah, I, I, I think that's been something that's been, uh, I, I think that in writing history, I think that's purely Roman influence when you see the women actually going down into almost a second tier uh, uh, type citizen role. I really think that's Roman influence when you start reading that throughout history, because before the Romans had that much influence on it, I think the women were on equal footing. I really do. Uh. I wonder, I, I, though there's no doubt that you're 100% right that Roman and classical antiquity has pigeonholed women and some of those stigmas and the patriarchy is around today. I mean, just like the Gregorian calendar, the Roman calendar, uh, so many of these things that we, we've talked about that are just remnants. Even the Catholic Church is structurally organized very similarly to, to ancient Rome when it was imperial. Um, so absolutely yeah. right, absolutely, and let's, we need let's to know who these authors are. The Catholic Church is just the uh, the continuation of the Roman Empire. In so many ways, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it was the one way Rome could survive was being becoming the Vatican. Yeah, and it's. It, I think you're right, and I think um, you know. I, I have to tell you, I have not read a lot of female Celtic authors or uh, historians and archaeologists, uh, only because I haven't seen a lot of publications by them. I, I want to. Um, I can make a few book recommendations for anybody interested. There's a book called War Women and Druids, which is a short read, an excellent read. Um, it is a, uh, it's, it talks about all three of those things in a concise mm -hmm. manner, but it's eyewitness accounts from contemporaries. So it's, it cuts out a lot of the historical analysis part and just tells you sort of like what things were like. Great book. Uh, Philip Freeman, I believe, is the author of that one. Okay. Um, great guy, great, great uh, author, and just a very knowledgeable person. Um, so anything like that, you, you know, you find something about the Celts or about any historical society that anyone is, is watching is interested in, you know, look at what people are saying, read the reviews, but like, they'll just dive in. If you're into it, you'll be able to weed through what what's good to adhere to and what's good to receive and what's not. It, it's trial and error some of the time, but, you know, I've been doing this for so many years now, and I, my interest is still as high as it was from the first day I picked up a book about it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, TJ, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, probably end the show right now, uh, just because we're running up on an hour, or running over an hour. Um, any last words? Just want to thank you man i've always had fun talking to you especially when we're talking celts which is one of my favorite things to talk about so. well it's been very interesting i have a whole page of notes of things i want to go look up now so that's going to be probably the rest of my night so hey anytime you want send me an email i'll uh send you some resources if you want i i would absolutely if you wouldn't mind send me some resources you know some things Certainly. that you've uh, read that you found interesting i'd i'd, I'd very much appreciate it but it. uh with that tj thank you very much for your time i know you're a busy man but I no do appreciate problem. you taking out time during your day to talk to me. And this is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast saying, you know what? Have a great day and keep your chin up. Bye-bye. Take care. Please hit the subscribe button. I get a bonus for every subscriber. And I only need 1,506 more to become a full-time paid employee. Help me, please.